best collectives here stretched the elastic of their culinary sounds as far as they could. My duty is to support and nurture their vision. What made you want to be in a culinary collective? Sound always excited me. Silence from an audience was always my fear. And anything I could do to break that silence became more important than anything else. continue our investigation into an array of interculinary disciplines. Yeah, good morning from me as well. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to talk uh, a career-spanning discussion in a way with uh, Peter Strickland here now. When I was asked um, if I could do that, um, I was not so sure because I knew his films, but um, I was never really thinking about um, uh, the connection between the films and because they occurred over the years and I then I started to watch them in a row and this really made sense. Uh, so I can heavily recommend this to watch his films like in a chronological order and ending with uh, Flux Gourmet obviously then tonight. And uh, because you see a lot of connections, a lot of uh, things developing throughout the films, even the short films. And uh, I will try to, to um, discuss with you now <laughs> some of these ideas probably which uh, occur in the films. So I think there's a, a whole, uh, an idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the whole body of work. This makes sense probably more than m some of those uh, little fragments like one short film here, one short film there. And if you see the whole picture, it's really, uh, it's really impressive. So, um, yeah, as this is planned to be uh, about all your films, uh, probably a good question to start with would be, um, uh, what's your background and how did you get into making films, actually? Is this, what was that a, a goal in the beginning? Or? Uh, my background, <coughs> I grew up in Reading, a standard middle-class household, um, very normal childhood. Um, I, it wasn't until I was 16 that I started to discover this other world. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed films for, you know, when I was in my, well, my whole life, like, 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 like everyone. Um, but when I was in my teens, I started to kind of make pretend films in my head, not wanting to make films, but just for, because I was bored, really. Um, then it got to the point, like, what if I'm having these pretend films, maybe I could do something. Um, and I saw a razor head at the Scala Cinema in London when I was 16, in 1990. And that completely changed everything, because <coughs> prior to that, I was, like anyone, watching Tom Cruise films, which I still love, by the way. So I, I'm nothing against those films. Um, but just a very different language, a, a very different way of seeing a very different way of hearing. Um, and then I thought, okay, this is the path I want to go down. Uh, but, especially at that age, you, you get so influenced by something. Everything I was doing was copying a razor head. I just couldn't break free from this influence. Uh, it took a long time. So I, I, I guess this kind of <coughs> Oedipal connection to that film and Whenever someone accuses me of ripping off David Lynch, there's a part of me that gets very um, hurt. <laughs> My 16-year-old self gets triggered. Um, but yeah, I after that, I joined like an amateur club for movie makers. 
on Super 8. It was all old men. There was only one woman there who was the secretary. <laughs> so it was a very male world. And they were making comedies of must, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you call it? Sorry, um, custard pies in the face, th this, this kind of thing, slapstick. But I could buy a second hand camera <coughs> for 15 pounds. The, the brown, is it Nizzo? Nizzo? How do you pronounce it? The N I Z O. Anyway. The brown, let's say, the, 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 the brown Super 8. I bought an editing kit, um, and I just learned bit by bit. It took about five years until I could do my first 16 mil film. So that's, that's the background, really, just bit by bit. But I think an important thing was I applied to Reading University Film and Drama to, do, to, to, to study film, filmmaking. Um, I got rejected, and that was a very strong part of the whole process in terms of giving me that motivation to knowing one path is closed, you kind of try even harder to do it by yourself, really. I totally can relate to that because um, I, I know many uh, filmmakers who got rejected, film school rejects, <laughs> uh, who uh, then decide, okay, now I will, I will do it anyway. And uh, that's a good motivation, obviously, yeah. and to do different films of them. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, if I was accepted, I would have gone, and it, I think things would have moved a lot faster because you have the connections there, you have networks, and without that, I mean, it's so much a key part of making films is knowing people, and that took, I think, 19 years until I could get my first feature in Berlin. But yeah, I, I, I do wonder, <coughs> would I have made the same types of films? I have no idea. I, I don't know. I think some of the things that people called idiosyncratic with my work is not, not by design, but because I wasn't formally trained. I didn't have that professional way of making films, which can frustrate some people in the crew, but I guess you get something a little bit different. But that's not by intention. So obviously you're very interested not only in making images but also in creating soundscapes and um, yeah, uh, sound design. Um, is it mainly the film scene background but um, or is there also a musical based background you have um, which your films come from? Well, I was in a band but that was after my first film. I Because I was working on 16 mil, it was so... Um, expensive, even for a middle class person, that I had to take a quite a long break. I think it was six year break. So I just went into the world of mostly working in offices and the money I earned, I put it into this band. But we were doing something <coughs> that I guess was mirroring my love of Alan Splett's work with David Lynch. So. I was not singing, so don't worry about that. You know, I um, yeah, we we cooked food. We um, we documented the cooking of food. There was no performing with food. We were not like the Vienna Vegetable Orchestra, uh, which I like, by the way, but just it was very different. Um, and we treated the sound. We documented the same way you treat food, where you chop it up, you process it, you layer it, you mix it. Um. So yeah, I, I definitely had a background in sound and I brought that to my first film. But what was interesting, when we made records, nobody was interested. I have stacks of records under my bed. We just couldn't get any interest. But when you use that same method in a film, we got attention. It was just very odd, which kind of made me think about people like Penderecki. I'm not trying to compare myself. But a lot of people don't like Pendanetsky, but if you put his images to, say, Kubrick's The Shining or David Lynch's Twin Peaks, suddenly it, it, it ignites the imagination. Uh, and the same with those Jallo soundtracks. If you look at, if you look, uh, consider Bruno Moderna with Death Laid an Egg. He was working with John Cage normally, or Luciano Berio, or Luigi Nono. So this connection between avant-garde and fantastical images is, is quite a strong, strong connection, really. Yeah, as you mentioned this, this is a very interesting connection as um, the films you refer to are the Italian uh, 
sometimes French, but mainly Italian genre films from the late 60s uh, till the mid 70s. We can say yeah, that. Yeah. And um, there, there was the idea to bring something fresh to it um, by any means, and as long as it works as an, on an exploitation or tension level suspense. So um, they worked with uh, very strange music, as you m mentioned, and even uh, people like Ennio Morricone had their experimental days back then. Um, Gruppo di Improvisazione Nuova Consonanza. I can't pronounce it well, but that, that group. Yeah. And um, so you have this strong interest, and in, um, it was mentioned before, I was actually asked um, to, to talk with you because I made this book, uh, handbook, um, film the uh, genre theory, and which is a unique book in Germany. It's 700 pages on genre theory. And I said, yeah, okay, but um, uh, Peter Strickland's films are not genre films. They work and deconstruct genre structures. And they work with genre elements and um, uh, and uh, look at them from a different angle. Would you agree to this description in a way? And what is your relation to genre cinema as you describe it? Well, I enjoy watching those films. Um, <coughs> maybe not for the same reasons as other people. Um, you know, when it comes to pornography, I can take it or leave it with the sex. When it comes to horror, I can take it or leave it with the violence. What I'm looking for is other things. Um, this lyricism, this dream logic, the, the music, the sound. Because um, I think with those directors, there's a mixture of some of them were not formally trained. Some of them were poets, but kind of knew they could actually get away with more within exploitation because basically all the producers cared about was you have X number of sex scenes and they're happy. They don't care what is in between. Whereas with my films, you have these meetings and you have to explain everything. Um, so individuality gets ironed out if you're not careful. Whereas in exploitation, they don't care about character or logic. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of terrible stuff, but the, the good stuff, you find these remarkable air pockets of I don't know what to call it, just wonderful stuff that is so dreamlike and unique. And so I'm kind of hunting for those little pockets of sublime madness, really. <laughs> It's a funny thing because if you study films of that era, you have uh, formerly trained directors like Lucio Fulci, he, who has a very high level of production at that time, and uh, but he manages to uh, give it a in a get it in a balance and has this poetical qualities as well. And you have other directors like uh, Jess Franco from Spain, who is very um, he's not disciplined and he uh, has uh, very low budgets, but he also manages to get s certain scenes of this poetic quality. And I have the impression that uh, your films are centered on these elements. Thus, I call it a kind of a genre deconstruction, as uh, you like uh, take these films apart, um, take some of those uh, impressions, and then um, imagine your own idea of these um, fragments. That's what I uh, had the impression when I saw Duke of Burgundy, for example. That's nice to hear that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess on a very um, practical level, I think it comes from being slightly narcoleptic, not totally. That I, I don't know about you, but I fall asleep when the lights go down. Um, so most films, I, I fall asleep or I'm half asleep. And from that, you get a very abstract filtering from those. So when I think of Jallo films, I don't think of the sadistic murders, I, I think of the hair and the atmosphere and the, the, s the textures and the but colors. Exactly, the and textures, the yeah, 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 yeah. I can totally relate to that because um, I was, I'm really interested in high level auteur cinema and so on, but I made uh, like books on Fulci and Argento, and I'm always asked in Germany especially uh, why I do that on an academic level that's not really interesting and so on. And that would be my um, idea about this because. This is what um, the uh, British uh, philosopher, no, the Australian philosopher, uh, Patricia McCormick called cinesexuality, the sexual pleasure that uh, you get out of uh, watching at film textures, colors, 
and listening to the sounds. And I think that's between, kind of the between the uh, plot relevant um, scenes in the films, basically. Yeah, plot, I, uh, both as a filmmaker and a viewer, I, I never really cared much about plot. Um, occasionally I might like it. But I think for me it was this interesting thing, this feeling of being between being asleep and being awake. And I had that in music as well. The music I loved had that quality in between. But I think Anne Bilson in The Guardian, she also put it very well quite recently. I think it was this year. Um, she did a list of Fulci films. And she ha said they all have this half asleep feel. Like she, s she was saying <laughs> the victims nev never run away. <laughs> they just kind of submit. Um, and that, again, maybe is a part of it. This you know, for me, the greatest films, the greatest concerts, or the greatest music are when you submit as a listener. If I listen to the early Swans albums, or I remember seeing My Bloody Valentine, there's this feeling of surrendering to uh, this power, this all-conceiving power. That's very important, I think. Uh, what uh, many people don't realize that uh, you have to trust a film or a performance to submit to it. And um, there is a German film critic who um, unfortunately already deceased, uh, Michael Alten, and he said it's not a bad thing to fall asleep during a film because it means you trust yourself to the film. And um, that's kind of this um, getting into another, like a twilight world between reality and imagination. Uh, yeah, I would agree with him, yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I fall asleep not because I trust the filmmaker. <laughs> Just because I'm just tired. Uh, I don't know why, but um, yeah. Don't fall asleep now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't worry. I, I have fallen asleep during the edits of my films occasionally. I mean, yeah. Matyash, the editor, will he will gleefully report about that. Yes. Um, when we see your uh, feature films, it's um, uh, Kathleen Varga is a reflection on the idea of uh, rape revenge films, but it's not a rape revenge film. So it, it plays with elements of a well-known uh, yeah, genre phenomenon, but it, it's this different angle which you um, uh, get to work there. Yeah, I mean, it definitely comes from that from that genre. I mean, I've seen a lot of those films. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to try something different um, and not show the attack. I remember when I wrote the, the recounting of the attack that I was so advised to put flashbacks in. I was like, no, 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 it has to be words only. I mean, I think words can be m more powerful. Um, I always think, you know, the less you give the viewer, the more the mind is compensating. Um, so there was no need to show the attack. Um, but I just wanted to show the complexity of it all, really, how um, you might get revenge on someone, but innocence always gets dragged into this. That person might have children who are completely innocent, and this whole endless cycle of revenge. So I wanted to make something very messy and I didn't want to show my opinion of right and wrong. Um, that's not relevant, just to show, um, yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, we, we've, we've all seen it. You know, you see these war criminals have done atrocities, terrible, terrible things, but they're family people and they might be quite pleasant in a bar to have a drink with, and but they're still monsters, and it's this, and you don't see that in film. That I mean, I mean, yeah, you do see. It. Okay, I remember Scorsese did it very well in Goodfellas. I mean, Joe Pesci's character is is he is a monster, mm -hmm. but he's great fun to watch, and you hate yourself for enjoying watching him. Not when he's killing. I'm not talking about that, but just his banter in between. Um, he's a funny guy. Sorry, you can't see it. <laughs> He's not a funny guy, but yes. <laughs> well, kind of he is sometimes. Um, yeah, th that's very interesting because this uh, first film, this first feature film we're, we're talking about now, um, he has this uh, very, uh, very effective use of drone sounds during uh, scenes where you don't expect drone sounds. And something you probably learned from David Lynch, like you put people with, mas uh, with uh, rabbit masks in a room and then you play a drone and it's really creepy. 
uh, but it could also be funny. And the thing is that uh, the aesthetics, the visual aesthetics of Katalin Varga are more uh, re realistic uh, than your later films, in my opinion. But um, combined with this drone, there is an uneasiness which uh, gives it uh, the idea of a, um, of a, a fairy tale going bad. Yeah, I mean, the drones, that came very early on. That's an existing piece of music by um, Stephen Stapleton and Jeff Cox um, called, oh my God, my memory. That's it, The Grave and Beautiful Name of Sadness. It's a very long piece. It's like over 20 minutes. And it's it's like a choral piece, a bit like um, Popol Vuh, but a soundtrack to Herzog's Nosferatu. Um, and I was listening to it on a train going through Transylvania and on my headphones. Unlike now where everyone plays it on their Bluetooth speakers and ruins everyone else's time, but anyway. Um, so yeah, it just blew my mind and I, I wrote to Stephen Stapleton and asked his permission that in a way would fuel the script. So that atmosphere was always there when I was writing. Um, yeah, I mean, Stephen Stapleton and Nurse with Wound were a big part of, I guess, this um, sonic language that I was trying to use. So Stephen Stapleton is part of the British post-industrial culture, as we could say. So uh, industrial culture beginning in the 70s with Throbbing Gristle and White House bands like that, and then moving into more experimental and very diverse uh, sound ideas. And Stephen Stapleton's Nurse with a Wound is a band or a project which uh, develops this uh, experimental way, which goes uh, again into uh, the direction of uh, Penderecki and Bela Bartok and those people. And uh, yeah, I realize, realize that in your later films as well, but there it might be original music and you, you have um, the use of sounds, um, the very distinctive use of sounds in Flux Gourmet, obviously, is uh, still reminiscent of this um, uh, this tradition, I would say. Uh, absolutely, yeah, and not just the sounds, but the, the, the actual structure of the film, the, the the editing of the film, the the repetition, the, the patterns, that all comes from the kind of music I, I was listening to. Um, we didn't use much Nurse with Wound in Flux Gourmet, we used, I think, seven seconds. Mm -hmm. I know that, because I was working on the contract, it was a seven second sample. Um, but it, it, it's all informed by what I was listening to, and not just the post-industrial stuff, but the stuff that influenced them. People like Arvin Lucia, Robert Ashley, who were much more stripped down. They were not using effects like we did. They just used natural acoustics. Um, Field recordings and protests. Yeah, Luke Ferrari as well. I mean, I mean the Lucia one was really strong for me because it was um, he did this piece called "I'm Sitting in a Room" where he records his voice and then plays back the recording and records that and does it again and again and again until his voice gets sucked into the room and disappears and there are no effects whatsoever. And I like it also because it's a very human thing because he has a stutter and I'm prone to stuttering sometimes. And um, So it's like a quest to erase your own stutter. So that I, it works on more than one level for a lot of listeners. For me, it was also interesting that there is, in fact, a connection between uh, those uh, musicians we mentioned and uh, the psychedelic uh, folk um, movement of the uh, 70s in England, like um, the soundtrack of The Wicker Man is probably well known. And I realized that... Oh, Giovanni. Uh, yeah, and uh, you re refer to this in the soundtrack uh, of Duke of Burgundy, in a way. Not more to the same... More barbarian. Yeah, but the idea of the psychedelic folk is also an element. That's what I realized in your films as well, and um, also reflected in the images because the aesthetics you use in some of uh, even the um, uh, the short film with the dogs, like uh, yeah, I've seen, <laughs> seen that. Um, You're the only one who's seen that, but yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, a bonus uh, film on the German DVD, so some might have seen it. Um, and I see th there's a, a really strong 70s as, um, avant-garde aesthetic as well in that. And you referred to uh, Stan Brackage as well in the moth light, in the use of uh, insects glued to the celluloid in his film and how you used uh, the insect images in Duke of Burgundy. Well, that's the advantage of digital. You don't have to kill insects anymore. You can just digitally make an insect. Uh, 
Yeah, because brackets glued moth wings and so on to the actual film strip. Well, I grew up on those films, but I grew up on reading about them more than actually seeing them. You couldn't see them. Occasionally, I think Mothlight was on Channel 4, but the other stuff, I had to wait sometimes eight, oh, five or six years to see them. So I bought a book by William C. Wees called Light Moving in Time. Talking about Mayor Darren, Anger, of course, um, Ernie Gurr, um, Michael Snow, Paul Sharrett's. Um, but I, I was obsessed with those films. And, and again, it was this, I don't have a very theoretical mind. It was much more physical and visceral and this feeling of catharsis. If you watch Tony Conrad's The Flicker, it's half an hour of flickering, which obviously you can't watch if, if you're epileptic. But if you're fortunate enough not to be, it's sublime. And the sound is so hardcore and repetitive. And I just love what it does to my state of mind. It's, I guess it's my equivalent of going to church, being a, a failed Greek Orthodox. Uh, this is a kind of American avant-garde cinema became a replacement. A surrogate, surrogate Orthodox church, how about that? Yeah, that's a very interesting connection because I wanted to ask you about the ritualistic structure of your films and uh, this uh, it's alienating for people focusing on plot and character development because your films go in circles and they um, at certain points return to an earlier point in time and then they, uh, things develop a bit differently then and uh, yesterday when we saw in Fabric it was um, a mention that it could easily be a series because uh, of all the owners of the dress in the film and um, it shouldn't be on in the logic of commercial filmmaking probably but uh, it totally made sense for me as a ritualistic work of art and that has a certain function I want to ask you about that what what is your idea about this cyclical uh, narration uh, not narration cyclical presentation of um, uh, events? Well, I think it's not so unusual. I mean, all of us have rituals, whether they're going to church. Um, Cleaning the two teeth. Uh, like Jean Dielman, you know, like the, the Chantal Ackerman film. Um, sexual rituals. Uh, so, I, I, I don't know. It's just something I really respond to. Um, this kind of cinema as a kind of incantation but it is a kind of witchcraft, in a very light sense, you know. I'm not, I know nothing about witchcraft in, in, the, in the traditional sense. Um, but yeah, it just, because uh, this whole idea in, in traditional cinema of the plot, and my, my worst enemy is the character arc. Because have you ever met anyone who's changed? Adults are always the same. An arsehole is always an arsehole, I'm sorry, but um, I, I don't know, I, I just, I'm more interested in the audience having an arc and discovering things. Like in the Duke of Burgundy, nothing changes, but your perception changes. And to me, that's more interesting. You know, a as a human being, um, when I know people, they don't change, but my perception of them changes, usually from being lovely the first time I meet them into being monsters by you know, the, <laughs> the <laughs> sixth time I meet them, but yeah, and probably vice versa. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, as someone w working and teaching film studies, uh, my approach is uh, the seduction theory of film. So I see film as a system of seductive strategies uh, who try to capture the audience and bring it from one point to another point which they wouldn't adopt for their real life, for example. So uh, what you mentioned in Katalin Varga is accepting um, the rapist as probably um, uh, a quite sympathetic family guy. And uh, then um, getting into a kind of crisis, like an ethical crisis, uh, that you prob probably feel things you wouldn't uh, accept in reality or, or want to accept. And uh, so um, would you agree to this idea of film as a system of seductive strategies? Are you working on that level? And what's the meaning of seduction within your films? Because there's always 
kind of people seducing, like in, in fabric we have this coven and uh, the, um, uh, the uh, clerk, uh, the attendant in the store and so on. And it's always su seductive things going on, but it's always uh, also uh, between the audience and the screen. Well, uh, for me, it's a lot more intuitive. And if, a, if, if there is a seduction, it's more about the, the whole all the parts together and the the sound the image the the overall total effect um with characters it's very hard hard to say um i mean certainly i wanted to kind of mess with the audience's head with Kotlin Varga you see the assailant 10 years later you only hear about what he did in the past um and you know it, it is a dangerous thing to do because obviously i would never you know, I think it's it's a terrible crime, um, and it's something you would you would never take lightly or even joke about. Um, but I, I was just fascinated by I, again the, these criminals that get caught forty years later, twenty years later, and they've. I mean, this idea that a criminal is always a criminal every day of their lives—it's just not realistic. Um, but it doesn't mean they <laughs> need to evade justice. It it just. Again, it's all about perception, really. That that's what was fascinating for me. Um, but uh, yeah, we, well, we, we're in fabric. The, the store. I, mean, I used to work in retail, so um, we were taught to seduce, submit, apologize. Um, British customer service is it fucks you up. It really does <laughs> because you are taught to take any crap from the public um so it kind of weakens you so when someone is rude to you in a shop you can't deal with it because you've repressed all your anger for years working in off licenses and restaurants and supermarkets so don't work in retail it really it, it's it really fucks you up but anyway <laughs> british retail at least you know um, we didn't talk about the Barbarian Sound Studio so far, and that's interesting because um, a lot of the topics which came up um, uh, could re be referred to this film or uh, connected with this film as well, because it's kind of an uh, Italian genre film told from the other side of the camera. That's basically the idea. So you never see uh, the film as a result but the film itself is kind of a um, comment or um, a, kind of a, f a reflection on filmmaking as a process, which becomes creepy in a way. Uh, how was that inspired? Well, I think many, it came across, well, like most things, it comes across from many different um, components. Because um, I did a version of it way before the one we all know. Um, in 2005, it was just a bit of a joke. It was for a competition. I think it was inspired oh yeah, by... short version. Yeah, I think it was just a friend's trousers. He had these thick trousers. When he walked, it made a sound like thunder. And I thought, ah, oh, Foley, you know, it makes sense. Um, but then I, I got to work with Foley artists on my first film. And, but I realized there's something much darker. We can go somewhere quite... Um, yeah, dark basically. Um, but also what we were talking about earlier with the, the music, the musical connection. Um, and I, I, I wanted to make something where the illusion of film, you know, the, the is is not there. You never see the film. Um, all you see is is the is the mechanics. Can we make that interesting? Can we involve the audience? Um, and you know, I think the idea of sounds and the um, the association of sounds, like when you stab a cabbage, we don't normally associate that with a murder, we associate that with the sound of a kitchen. Um, so you, it's just about context, and I'm always fascinated by context, especially in my new film, which is, a lot of it is about stomach problems, which are normally done as comedy. Um, so you're just switching the context to make you kind of reassess things, really. And you know, I, I the scenes are, really unpleasant, even though you don't see them. In a way, I find them more offensive because you have these very comical images of middle-aged men smashing watermelons. But what the context is extreme 
misogyny. It's um, about as violent as, 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 as you can get. Um, so it does, like Cotton and Varga, it does mess with your head. Um, again, I'm not guiding you how you should react. But, um, yeah, so I, 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 I don't, I don't know. I, I, I guess I enjoy that with people like Hanukkah, where they really screw you, basically. You, you're just not sure how, how, how to react. Uh, th that's what I meant by seductive strategies, because you play with the audience's mind, and uh, it's, it's open how they will react, and if they fall for it, for your idea, but um, they will react in, an in any way. And uh, so you're, um, you're stressing out that film is a manipulative medium. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I subscribe to that. And to be deceitful, I think deceit is a huge part of cinema, and I embrace it. You know, politicians are full of deceit. What, why can't filmmakers be full of deceit? <laughs> I don't know. Um, another element which um, is seems to be more and more important in your films uh, is uh, fetishism, like um, the uh, adoring certain um, certain elements, certain parts of the body, certain uh, clothing, and so on, which seem to have a certain power, like a mana, which is included in them and uh, can be adored by certain people, and also is uh, proposed to the audience. Like, um, we learn to, um, to appreciate these things during the film, while watching the film. So we learn, oh, this is, that could be really interesting. <laughs> I, um, I had this um, process during Duke of Burgundy, for example, and during Flux Gourmet. And le yesterday, it's the same in, in Fabric, because that's also seductive. You bring us to uh, reflecting on how we relate to certain elements to certain textures and so on and um, yeah uh yeah well i loved films that employed that use of fetishism uh and not you know it can be in the sexual sense but it can go way beyond that as as well uh Parajanov with his work with in the colored pomegranates or shadows of our forgotten ancestors it's a very different kind of fetishism it's, it's a religious fetishism, um, but uh, Schwankmeier, Jan Schwankmeier, um, the brothers Quay, Boonwell, he was, I think he was, he really understood fetish fetishism. Um, you, you quote uh, him as well, Viridiana, the title? Um, I in, in so fabric. for my love, I, mm, yeah, I suppose there's a degree of fetishism. I, I was thinking of, you know, Belle du Jour and, you know, um, but um, Viridiana's, that's a brutal film. I think that's his most cynical film, for me anyway. Um, you yeah. talked about mm. Rob, uh, Alain Robgrier, um, the French writer and um, a filmmaker, uh, who also wrote uh, Last Year at Marienbad, which he is probably most famous for, but it's not his most typical work. And he had this huge fetish for Manica, um, like the... the uh, the um, the dolls from uh, department stores, which you also play around with a lot. Well, I can't speak on his behalf. I don't know if he had this erotic feeling. I find them terrifying. Um, when I was a kid, I used to have nightmares about them because the 70s mannequins, it was the hands. It was all about the hands. They were so... The fingers were so long, and the, the they were like, like this, as if they're putting a spell on you. Cracks you have in, the in cracks, fabric there, yeah. the cracks, uh, cracks occurring on the yeah. uh, skin there. Well, it, that's very, uh, it's a very tragic story as well because um, Aoife, who, well, I know it's too tragic actually, but anyway, um, no, you don't want to know. It's a very upsetting story, but anyway, but basically that, that was, um, <coughs> that was uh, an original mannequin from the 70s. Some of those were made by the production team, um, but, uh, yeah, I remember, you know, dolls, not, not, not just mannequins, but, you know, we all, we're all terrified of dolls. Or find them very, I don't know what the word is. I, I, I guess I always liked miniature things. I was at the airport in Hanover and had this miniature airport. <laughs> I stopped to have a look at it. Um, it's just, I think what it is, is, it's just their little worlds. It's like a fake world you can go into. Um, but... 
But Ob Grille was very interesting, obviously, because he made, no, he didn't make, he wrote the image which Radley Metzger directed. And I think Metzger's quite an interesting director. Um, but last year, Marienbad was, to me, it's one of the first ASMR films without knowing it was ASMR. I, I, if you look at it on that level, it's really, that is very yeah, there's seductive. There's this uh, hypnotic voice going over the images all through the film and it's reflecting on what might be seen, and sometimes it is seen, and sometimes uh, sometimes it's contrary to that what is shown in the images, like uh, talking about crowds of people and then there's empty rooms, uh, but it's a kind of meditative quality of film, which you refer to then. Yeah, and I, that's my personal taste. That's what I really key into. Um, and I, I think when I was younger, I, I, I was seeing Marion Bad when I was in my late teens, uh, and I didn't get it. I was struggling and struggling with the meaning, and then I later learned to just let go and not worry about what it means. And I think the same with the Quay brothers, with Street of Crocodiles. I remember seeing an interview with them, and they were saying, well, nobody questions a ballet. Nobody tries to decipher what it means. So it's just, it's just putting on a different head when you watch certain films, and um, I, uh, I've, I've noticed a pattern that musicians tend to like my films more than film people. Film people usually tend to hate my films. Um, but I think with musicians, they just understand the dynamics, the highs, the lows, the structure, the, the repetitive elements. So it's interesting, you know, because in music we can all accept repetition and, you know, the verse, the chorus, the verse, and these patterns, but in film, everyone rejects it, really. And it's based on atmosphere and a certain flow. And I refer to um, your films being not genre films while being reflections on genre films before. And uh, I think genre fans will really get frustrated with your films. If they get so... I have been. I mean, you have seen the, the Blu-ray of, uh, the German Blu-ray of In Fabric. It's called The Blood Red Dress, which is like a really cheesy horror title. And In Fabric is, has so many meanings. And it's uh, so more appropriate to, to what you actually do in the film. And the film is totally frustrating for genre people uh, because um, it doesn't really make sense in the end. It has this cyclical structure. Okay, that has uh, probably Halloween as well. But um, it's uh, on, a, on a different level. It works on the idea of atmosphere and flow and uneasiness on a um, different idea than, uh, let's say, a film like The Conjuring or something like that which is searching for explanations. I haven't seen, by the way. You haven't seen, okay. Um, but which many people would connect with, like uh, ghost films or something like that. And if I uh, want to sell in fabric as a ghost film, it doesn't work. What would you sell it as? What? What would you sell it as? <laughs> fetish, <laughs> fetish film, right, there you go. Yeah, it answers everything. It's um, a yeah. I mean, it's a it's a genre refle a reflection. It's an art house film. It's a, it can be sold as an auteur film, um, and much better. I, it is. It will work for the movie audience, definitely. You say movie or movie? Movie. A oh, movie. Okay. Yeah, okay. the streaming yeah, yeah. streaming platform, which some of your films are already there. Yes. And yeah. I th I know, not many, but I know people who are really eager to watch those films, uh, your films as well on on movie. I mean, when I do the applications, uh, I usually write drama mm -hmm. because it's, just, it's, if you say horror, I'm not trying to be a snob and say I'm above horror, or it's even worse term, elevated horror, which I really don't like. It, it's, it's just because I, I, you don't want to miss sell something to an audience. You want to, especially these days when everyone doesn't have much money, you, if you buy a DVD, you want to know what you're getting. So I think people just get very disappointed, especially Flux Gourmet, because it's not a horror at all, and I, I've got no problem with horror, but you just don't want to deceive. <laughs> well, it's a weird thing, cause I, I like deceiving the audience once they're bought into it, but you don't want to deceive them initially. So there's sort of different layers of, different levels of deceit which are acceptable and not acceptable. And I think Some deceit is acceptable, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, a bit similar to the cinema of uh, Katet E. Fossani uh, with oh, Amer, for example. Um, because that was also sold as a psychothriller, neo giallo, and in fact it's, it's just a reflection of those uh, formali uh, for, um, formalities. And um, like the giallo form as a basis. 
and then going beyond that, like the uh, probably the deeper psychological structures of how these images work, and then it awakes something in you which probably feels similar, but it's a, a different um, way which leads to there. I mean, I love Ellen and Bruno. I think they're great filmmakers, and Lucille Haji Halilovic, yeah. she's yeah. great. Um, it's, um, Earwick is her new film. I love it's that film. It's can be seen on Mubi right now. Oh, it's on Mubi. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's the only way to see these films because they are not sold on Blu-ray anymore in Germany. I mean, I saw Earwick. Well, I was very lucky. I saw it in the cinema, but it had a very small release. I mean, Black School Me. I mean, again, just a couple of weeks. That that's all you can hope for now, yeah. if you're lucky enough to get it in the cinema. Um, so it's been great to have all of you because I recognize some of you from the screenings if I do this. Oh wow, there's more people yeah, than I there thought. Are some no. And we, so can actually on the back. Okay. we can actually open up the discussion right now um, to the audience. If there are like remarks or questions, feel free to um, inspire us. That sounds like a serious question, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I would like to know if uh, within the process of filming and uh, with the film ready, you foresee all the questions that will be asked just in these audiences, or the, the you know your roots of every scene you um, make? What was the first part, sorry? Uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I, okay, the I can talk. No, the, uh, uh -huh. I um, you can ask in German and I can translated probably okay ich möchte eigentlich wissen während des filmprozesses ob es ein bewusstsein für diese ganzen äh, wurzeln einzelner szenen gibt und ob er dann mit dem film fertig in diesem in so einer runde in einer gesprächsrunde all das erwartet was äh, gefragt wird <lacht> okay he would like to know if during the making of the film if you already reflect the roots of your inspiration which uh, these scenes are based on, if you already reflect it during the making of the film, and then um, you refer to that when we talk about this, or when you are asked about it. Well, sometimes the, yeah, some scenes are based on something I, I, I love. Um, I think one example from off the top of my head would be um, Peter Tchaikovsky's Outer Space. We try to mimic that. Not as well as he can do it, but um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you never get there. You always end up doing something different purely by, by the nature of things, not, 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 not by design. Um, and you kind of embrace what it becomes, if that answers that question. Um, but, you know, I think these days I try to do less with influences. I think Flux Gourmet... We have a few influences here and there with Pasolini or the, ac the Viennese actionists, but really I try to just do something. I've I was doing it too much, especially in Bavarian and the Duke of Burgundy, and I wanted just to kind of be free of influences. And within the creative process, I would say it's uh, inevitable that you um, incorporate things before which then come up and you don't reflect in them probably at the moment. Um, and then it, it comes back to you when they, you ask about it, probably. Yeah, actually, you know what? <laughs> There's a slight tangent here, but music is a good example for this. Because then the influences are very specific. I remember, uh, very tragically, um, with Trish Keenan and James Cargill, who are otherwise known as Broadcast. Or, yeah, well, Trish died very sadly. Um, but when, when I knew her, when I showed her the script for Barbarian, when I met Trish and James, Trish suggested drumming for the soundtrack, and I was, you know, I was too polite to say no, but she could see in my face, I was wondering, what, what is this? Um, so I was sending them Morricone references, uh, which are very obvious, um, and I really wish I listened more to Trish and James. I, I think they could have taken the soundtrack in a more interesting direction, which was more them. Um, because I heard a, a broadcasting they did with drumming much later. It was this kind of very rare release and it only came out last year. Or was it last year or this year? And it, I thought, ah, 
okay, I know what she means now. Not kind of Van Halen drumming, <laughs> but um, it's very creepy, slightly soporific drumming, which could have really... R ritualistic drumming. Not even ritualistic. I can't, I can't really describe it, but... Um, so I think that taught me to just let go of influences with music um, and trust trust musicians. I'm not a musician. Um, <coughs> so when I did the Duke of Burgundy with Rachel and Farris, um, again, they both have this very strong musical background, Farris more in rock and roll with, with, with the horrors and Rachel coming from a classical background. Um, so then I learned more how to kind of, <sighs> you have references but you're talking more about the mood of those references, the tone of the references, not the chord changes. Otherwise, you end up sounding like those adverts which can't afford <laughs> a John Williams piece, and they get someone to sound like John Williams. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was the key, to just talk about mood. You know, when, you have, when you're influenced by something, talk about why it's influencing you, what with the mood of it, not how to copy it bit by bit. So it's a critical way of uh, reflecting your initial idea uh, to uh, send them Morricone pieces because it's so obvious to use Morricone when you refer to a certain uh, era which you reflect on, but trust them in doing an, an own take on it, if I understand it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I you know, it was a new, because in, in Kotlin Varga, all the music was existing. Mm -hmm. So Barbarian was my first time working with musicians. And it is, you know, it's like working with actors. It's something you develop over time. Uh, and that was a very, very, very dark time. I mean, Trish died very suddenly. Um, so it's very hard to be objective, you know, because I'm a huge fan of broadcast. And um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's. Um, I, I can't be objective if, if I'm honest. You know, even the film, I can't be objective because that, that that was not a pleasant time. Are there other questions or remarks? English or German doesn't matter. Ich muss leider auf äh ja, ich muss leider auf Deutsch stellen, weil mein Englisch ist leider nicht so gut. Ich verstehe auch leider nicht alles. Nee, Russisch spreche ich nicht. Nee, aber der Punkt ist. Ähm, ich frage eigentlich jedes Mal, würde ich auch Sie gerne fragen, ähm, wie ist Ihre Liebe zum Film entstanden? Weil äh, ich habe gehört, jetzt rausgehört, dass das Erasure Head war mit 16, dass der Sie beeindruckt hat, der Film. Bei mir fing die Liebe zum Film schon viel früher an. Ich habe mit sechs Jahren Krieg der Sterne gesehen. Und äh, dieses Erlebnis hat mich zum Film gebracht. Early und Influences, Childhood Influences. Und ja, Kinder, äh, also... Also mit sechs Jahren habe ich diese Erfahrung gemacht und die hat mich jede Woche danach zum Kino gebracht und alles geguckt, was, es ging, was ich gucken konnte. Und da wollte ich einfach fragen, äh, wie die Liebe bei Ihnen entstanden ist, quasi. Zum okay. Kino, zum Film. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, influence of Eraserhead, which was in your teens, is there something earlier like childhood, uh, initial childhood experiences with going to cinema or something which is probably not that conscious or uh, as an early influence? That was the question. Uh, childhood. But first of all, isn't there someone in the audience wearing an Eraserhead t-shirt? I saw someone. Where is he? You, you have the t-shirt. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Uh, hello, hi. Um, yeah, I, well, I mean, w what I should say about Razorhead, um, so much of it was about me, not in terms of my, my big ego, but in terms of being 16 and being hungry, being open, being ready, being new, being innocent. If I saw Razorhead now as a jaded adult who's worked in retail, maybe I wouldn't be so open to it. Um, but at that age, you are just absolutely consumed by, 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 by these things. So, so much of it is about timing. Not trying to put Lynch's film down, but I think it's not just a film. It's about the place, the time, all these things. Uh, before that, um, well, I hadn't really seen an art house film before that, so it's just mainstream stuff. I remember seeing, uh, I mean, Robocop, I saw that, and I was absolutely, What's the word? Disturbed. 
it was just so strong. I saw it when I was 15, so I was too young. Um, but I saw it in an open-air cinema, because I'm half Greek, so we used to go to Greece for the summer holidays. And back then, they didn't care about age restrictions. So there were parents taking their kids to see it. Yeah, and in the Mediterranean uh, oh my countries, God. It's, uh, I saw The Fly in um, 86, I guess. I was like 14, 15, 14, and there were uh, little children crawling through the aisles. Um, because nobody cares, it was uh, there was no age restriction on the fly. It's not good. Cronberg um, one, obviously. I know. I, I think I'm. You need age restrictions. I'm sorry. Um, I know it, it doesn't sound very liberal of me, but you can't see these films as a kid. I remember seeing one kid throwing up um, during Robocop. So that was, you know. But even for me as a 15 year old, it was too much. You know, I think it did mess with my head quite quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't see any art house stuff. No, no. M may maybe Jacques Tati a little bit. I saw Star Wars. I was six years old. Oh, okay. I saw Star Wars. I was no. six years old. It, it was a uh, boom. It was wow for me as, as a kid. But even that is very strong. You know, that scene when Luke's uncle and aunt are slaughtered, it's you're seeing corpses in a, used in a universal certificate film. I, I don't want to sound like Mary Whitehouse now. But, <laughs> um, you know, who am I to talk? I've made some pretty awful things, but you know, you know what I mean. Just, there's an age for these things. Um. Okay, is there another question? Um, in the Duke of Burgundy, there's uh, this scene where uh, the entomologist uh, uh, um, holds some lectures, and the scene repeats itself several times. And uh, the room is full of women, and there are two mannequins. Only two. Uh, on, only two. Yeah, I counted right. Yes. Uh, I think there are a few more, but okay. sorry, I'm just I being I silly. I thought, really I thought there were only two, and I saw uh, in fabric yesterday for the first time, and then I thought to myself, okay, this guy really likes mannequins. But uh, I, I still, I want I still <laughs> wonder, um, and these are two questions really, um, why were the mannequins there in the Duke of Burgundy? And um, have you seen Blood and Black Lace by uh, Mario Bava? I've seen Mannequin as well, uh -huh. the film with Andrew McCarthy, I haven't seen that which one. is not, not great. Um, um, well, the Duke of Burgundy, if I'm brutally honest, it was just a joke, and I had no idea it would have this thing that would haunt me for the last nine years where it just keeps coming up in Q&As. I, um, and it's not because of money, because they're actually more expensive than humans, bizarrely. Um, I just, there was absolutely zero meaning behind it. It was just messing with the audience. But yeah, in hindsight, I wouldn't have done it because I think it distracts people. They're, they're, they're looking for a meaning where there isn't a meaning. Uh, I watched it with my girlfriend, and uh, she didn't even notice them. <laughs> so oh, I that's probably for the best. That that's perceptions for the best, yeah. are really uh, different in that yeah. way, and I, I, I thought it was really funny. Uh, so uh, I mean, within fabric, that's much more. What's the word? Part of the world. Um, having worked in shops and going to department stores as a kid. The mannequins was, was such a huge part of that world and there was something very ghostly about them, very scary about them. Um, they almost felt like they were guarding the shops, <laughs> like security guards, um, but in a very sinister way. Uh, so yeah, there was this kind of sinister feeling and I think we view the shops as something very bland and prosaic. Um, and I wanted to see, can you find a haunting within the shops? can you give this M.R. James sensibility in that world? I mean, normally we associate M.R. James and ghostwriters with this misty beach or the haunted house in the country. Can you bring that way of thinking to the high street? And there is an eeriness to shopping, um, especially if you've worked in shops. When you're doing a stock take or when you're opening up in the morning, you have to get there very early, especially in winter, it's dark and you see the queues of people outside and yeah, I, so I was just looking for the, these elements and the, and the mannequins were a big part of it and I wanted this feeling that the humans sometimes look like mannequins, sometimes the mannequins look like humans and they become all blended in. 
and the mannequins menstruate. Um, why not? Yeah. And, and Blood and Black Lace by Mario Sorry, Barber. I have seen, seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. There was a two month Mario Barber season in 1998. Uh, it's now called the BFI South Bank, but it was called the National Film Theatre then. And I saw, back in the days when I could see more films, I saw quite a few of those Barber films. So, yes, that was very. Um, the atmosphere was very, very strange in that film. And I saw in the same season Danger Diabolic, which I ripped off for Flux Gourmet. I won't say more than that, but yeah. So yeah, there was one, inf it was more like a costume influence. So yeah, okay. I can never totally rid myself of influences. Ich muss einmal kurz in Deutsch weitermachen. Ich habe es gerade versucht, im Kopf zu formulieren. Es geht nicht. Ähm, es ist mehr ein Kommentar noch als eine Frage. Ähm, ich fand das Element des Gruselns und des Horrors in uh, The Fabric ähm, sehr spannend, weil das mit dem Kleid bei mir sehr gut funktioniert hat in der Szene, mit dem, wo der Vogel stirbt, ich habe mich selten so verjagt. Also wirklich, ich bin so zusammengezuckt und einfach als, ja vielleicht als Kompliment, ähm, ein schwebendes Kleid hat mir selten so viel Angst gemacht. Also ich habe das nicht erwartet. Und ähm, ja, vielleicht als ja, Kompliment an die Inszenierung und an Spannung aufbauen. Okay, this is ja. a positive remark to in fabric, not a question. It's about uh, the effectiveness of uh, the uh, this um, dress, uh, especially in the scene where uh, the the bird is killed in the cage, and uh, she wanted to stress out how effective this was for her and how frightening uh, a dress can actually be. Uh, she was shown in that film, and so it's a positive remark to your direction. Thank you, thank you. Um, I remember when we had to film the dress falling from the sky in the nighttime scene. And we tried different ways of doing it. And at one point, one of the effects people tried a drone. He yeah. managed to string the dress from the drone. So the drone was flying. I wish I had a video of it. He sent me a test video. And the dress was hanging from the drone, but so stiff. It just it was like it was like it's on a on a on a coat rail. And I think that was the problem with some of the scenes in the house. If I could go back, I would I would change them. We wanted it to be more like a like a jellyfish to have this sensuous threat to it, this kind of undulation, which is beautiful but threatening. Um, and eventually one of the team got in this barrel, which is like a wind machine, that you put the dress on top of it and you just press the button and it shoots it up in the air and you quickly film it floating down. But I took a lot of attempts to get it right and it was, we could hear bird song and I thought, oh no, it's going to get light very soon. Like, Come on, let's hurry up, let's hurry up. Um, eventually we just about got it before dawn. But yeah, I, um, objects are, they're not easy things to film. And the other problem with objects is actors, they get quite offended sometimes that you're focusing on a piece of cloth more, more than their great acting skills. <laughs> so I've had some incidents where, yeah, I'm not very popular. Um, because you know, normally on a big film you would have a second unit or you'd have pickup days. Well, we have pickup days, but they tend to be very short. We usually have th three maximum to shoot objects and so it's sometimes it's just very very rushed but thank you i'm i'm glad yeah the bird was fine by the way just in case in case you're wondering but yeah well fir first i'd like to thank you for attending braunschweig thank you for inviting me thank you yeah. peter since you also a very prolific um, short film director. Could you please elaborate, especially on the five short films you selected for this program? Uh, yeah, well, um, what are they? Um, Cobblers Lot and Black Narcissus. They're all very different. Um, so I think it was just a, a, a mix of um, trying things out. Uh, I think when I began, Begun, begun. Oh, my head. Sorry, excuse me, my, my grammar. Um, I. W it was more like a, a way to get funding. So I had, had to kind of. I felt I wasn't really being me because I was just doing it as a way to get feature film made. Whereas now I'm very lucky at the moment. <laughs> it might change, but there wasn't that pressure with a short film. I could just do whatever I want. And that really freed me up 
Um, so I, I, I always like that that way of of of, of working because um, normally in film there are these steps. You make the short film, the small independent feature, then the bigger one, then the Hollywood one, then the Marvel film. Um, which is fine, you know, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but I was into, I guess, again, music. Bands wouldn't always work that way. If I think of bands I loved, like um, Stereolab or Sonic Youth, who would, they would have this trage tra trajectory, I can never say that word, where they do the, the, the bigger albums, but they'd, they'd do a, like a, a contribute a piece to a compilation on an underground label, they'd do like a small seven inch single somewhere else. So it was that mentality which I found can keep you hopefully quite fresh. Um, and also, I think there are things I can do in my shorts that I, I would not be allowed to do in a feature film, especially tonight's film. There's no way I could get away with that in a feature film. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, but there's still part of what I do, you know, my obsessions and kind of working them through really. Um, Tonight's film, uh, Flux Gourmet, reminded me, and not only me, I, uh, I have to admit, um, of The Belly of the Architect by Peter Greenway. And um, it's not that I thought that y it's kind of a remake or anything, I, I just it reminded me of that. And I asked myself, is there something typical British with um, dealing with the idea of food and digestion and all these elements? Because it's funny, I, I only came up with, uh, with, with British films who uh, really refer to this, and uh, probably it has to do with the mentality or uh, this um, British uh, society structures. Uh, it's just a question. It's not like a uh, full-grown thesis. <laughs> it's just an idea which came up. Well, yeah, I've seen the film for sure. I wasn't really thinking about it when I made Flux Gourmet. Um, but the wider question about British attitudes to um, bodily things, whether it's pleasure, whether it's going to the toilet, um, it's either not spoken about or it's done as comedy. You, you kind of can't, if I compare it to Scandinavian attitudes where it's a body is a body, there's nothing we have to kind of hide or nothing we have to kind of laugh about. It just, it is what it is. Um, so, I mean, the British attitude I never quite got. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to explore things that we just don't talk about, and that I feel, why can't we talk about them? Um, and it led to the other idea of the film, which is about shock value and taboo. The whole film is about artists breaking taboo, and I, I mean, my well personally, I, I. I I think taboo is only interesting when you're confronting a taboo which maybe shouldn't be a taboo. So I think the, the Warhol, Paul Morrissey films are really fascinating there because they broke sexual taboos. Um, Fassbinder again was doing that. Uh, and again, I wanted to kind of open up a discussion about the stomach. That Because, uh, you know, I think there are ways of talking about it without being vulgar or crude. Um, and and again, it's about context. I, I, I think, sure. I mean, flatulence is funny if someone does it on purpose, like now to disrupt a film director. That's funny. Come on, let's let's be honest about it. But um, yeah, if someone is suffering, if someone is um, can't go out, and their social life is hindered, and they can't even talk about it, um, that's something. It's just wrong that you can't discuss that. And obviously, a film can't. Um, solve people's medical problems, but I think a lot of this is psychological, that um, there is a shame there, and if you can destigmatize it, if someone can be feel free to talk about, they have extreme wind, they have diarrhea all the time, and if I don't feel embarrassed, I think that's quite a healthy thing. Um, but yeah, in Britain, it's always done with a bit of a wink, a bit of a nudge, and yeah, it's just, that's just Britain. We're a, bit we're a bit repressed, you know. It's mainly presented as a, a breaking of a taboo. It's like um, in a film like Train Spotting when he dives into the dirtiest toilet or something like that. So it's um, ex uh, exposed in a way. 
and what you do is a different approach because uh, you have it's a kind of empathic uh, approach with uh, someone who has problems and they are dealt with and they are a kind of a motor within the film for this certain character yeah it's a motor for someone who wants to appropriate someone else's suffering which is we're all guilty of it as writers we all we're magpies we steal other people's suffering and use it for our own artistic grand visions um so i was interested in that it wasn't just his suffering but the idea of art appropriating and stealing someone else's um problems um and it all just l it all kind of linked in really again you know with the idea of taboo uh, there was there was an organic link between the process you go through to have a diagnosis when you have stomach issues whether that's it could be a whole list of issues, but th the process is usually the same, you know, from gastroscopies to colonoscopies. Um, so it's it's a, you know it's a kind of meditation on that. It's it's a, it's a nightmare version of that. I think um, to have a colonoscopy in public I is 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 a nightmare. Um, mm -hmm. It's a. But uh, just w w one last thing. Yeah. But also, what it did open up is the colonoscopy in public. Also, has this idea of the self in art, and I think Flux is to, is to do with that. Where you have Fatma's character who is curating herself. She's lying about her middle class background. She's lying about her guilt in her childhood. Um, like all of us, she is erasing the bad bits and twisting the truth. Uh, and you have Marcus's character who's he wants to be invisible, he's exposed. And I think in, I remember Joanna Hogg talking about this a few weeks ago at a festival, and when you write your own stuff, you are embarrassing yourself. People are gonna think you um, have all kinds of torrid sexual fantasies. And um, so there was this element of, there was a, a risk to this thing, and the idea of, of yeah, exposure and being vulnerable to, um, I mean, there's a line in the film when Mackis says something something so private, sacrificed for the sake of art. And there was a catharsis in that, of course, but also there was a deep embarrassment in that. It's interesting because uh, recently uh, David Cronenberg, uh, who was always called like the king of body horror or something, uh, he said, no, it's not body horror. I am presenting my own as intestines as an artist to the public. And that's what I wanted to show with uh, Crimes of the Future, le that uh, Viggo Mortensen plays him as the artist presenting his own intestines as a kind of work of art to the public. And that's very similar to what you just said. I haven't seen it. Yeah. I want to see it. I have heard from a few people that there are links. Um, but you know, I mean, this idea, wh wh what you just mentioned, it can go back to dead ringers. It's not not as explicit from what you described, but um, it's kind of a, a logical extension of what, I remember there's a line in Dead Ringers about if they could have given an award for beauty on the inside. Would you say film can also can be uh, a medium for philosophy, for presenting philosophical ideas on not necessarily an intellectual way, but in an uh, um, intuitive way, in an emotional way that evokes um, philosophical questions? Well, I, I would certainly say debate, discussion, that I try to, I think writing is usually prompted by confusion. You're confused by something. Uh, you want to solve something which you'll never solve. Um, you know, humans confuse me. I, I, I don't understand humans. I think humans are strange. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I think mean, a good example would be the Duke of Burgundy. I, I don't have the answer to it. That You know, you have compromise. You know, you have this woman who uh, feels very uncomfortable putting on a persona to be a, a dominant woman. Um, so should she do this, be this person that she's not to please her lover, or should her lover repress her deepest desires to give her lover an, an easy life? The normal answer would be split up, find someone else, <laughs> you know. Um, if it's more, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you have this couple who are deeply in love, deeply involved, and um, obviously there are elements of, you know, this provokes discussion about compromise, coercion, 
who should compromise and so I think my films I think they, they just recognize problems more than point you in one direction I I try mostly to be, be like a football referee just to not like in flux call me I'm not taking sides whether the artist is right or the patron is right um, my I try to not be didactic which can be dangerous sometimes you know with very very serious things such as Scotland Varga which is you know um, very you know I mean rape is always wrong there's just no ambiguity there whatsoever um, but in terms of the perception of a character that's but even that is dangerous so yeah it's, it's a tricky line to to follow triggers and um, evokes questions more than it uh, presents ideas I would think so. I mean, I, I you know, I think to have a, a debate afterwards is is a healthy thing, even if it ends up in getting cancelled. <laughs> yeah. Are there more questions? Okay, so please. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, Hi. We're going to go to that bar later <laughs> on. <laughs> that was my it's question. It's in our diary. <laughs> that was your that was your question. Okay. No, no. Uh, I have. T uh, I just wondering how the how you pitch your movies for investors and producers because they are so abstract and art house. How do you put your movies in words to get people give you money? Well, it took a long time. It took um, decades. Um, what really helped was my first from Kotlin Varga, which was self-funded. I had an inheritance and that was made for 30,000 euro up until the edit, then we had to find from the Romanian Film Fund an extra 70,000 euro to do the sound mix and to scan the 60 mm ne negatives. But after that, it got into Berlin and that was a huge, huge seismic change in my life because suddenly people would come to me. I didn't have to come to people. Before I was knocking people's doors, it was just impossible, impossible. And I don't, I'm not bitter about it, I get it. They have thousands of people knocking on their doors, so um, the only way for me was to do it myself, get it noticed and then people would come to me. And then it was very easy to make Barbarian Sound Studio. I'm sorry to sound arrogant, but it was. Um, and it was even easier to make the Duke of Burgundy. People would just kind of say, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I want to do this. You'd work to scale, you know, you wouldn't have millions. Um, the Duke of Burgundy was just over a mi no. Was it a million or 1.1 million? I, I can't remember now. But now it's got harder again. I think with the, the, the world of, the way we see films is changing, with streaming, the pandemic, um, cost of living, all, all these things. And now it's getting harder and harder. So Flux was, you know, I think it was <laughs> going up a hill. The peak was Duke of Burgundy and it's going down again. Um, so I think I'm almost back to knocking on people's doors. <laughs> so I, um, I, in a way I'm very lucky because I, I realize this is, this is gonna happen. It happens to most directors. So I, f I think five years ago, I took on writing work for other directors. And that's been a huge lifesaver for me financially that I can have this other job. Um, I want to direct television, but I usually get rejected. Or someone will offer me something and I say yes, then they disappear, never answer my emails again. Um, that usually means another director's dropped out. They've gone to maybe five directors and they don't bother to say, oh, by the way, we found someone else. So I just think, oh, I can't be bothered. I'm sick of it. I'm happy to write. I could stay at home. I don't, don't have to deal with people. Um, so yeah, that's quite a cynical answer, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Do, 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 do you make it's films? A gr great ending. <laughs> oh, do, uh, are, are, are you a filmmaker? No, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm just a media student. <laughs> All right, so I haven't put you off, I hope. Because, uh, no. you know, I, 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 my friend who is not here uh, is a filmmaker and he has, has the same taste of film like you. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it varies in different countries. I, I, I don't know about Germany, but in Britain, well, it's got better, actually. Um, I think what it is. My cynicism is about being at a certain point after five films. I think if you're a new filmmaker now, things are pretty good. Uh, because, you know, I think when you've reached five films, you can't really go to most of the public funders. 
which is fine. I mean, I, I, it's understandable because they can't keep funding the same directors. They have to fund new directors like you. Um, so, so in a way, that's quite positive for you um, because, but seriously, no, I mean, there's great, great new filmmakers out there in Britain. I don't know about Germany, but, you know, I think of um, Rose Glass, Prana Bailey Bond, Charlotte Wells, um, Mark Jenkin. Uh, they're making, it's much better now in Britain, despite Brexit, which is terrible. Um, actually, it's not better in Britain, is it? No, no. But in a film, you know, if I think of the 1990s, in the mid-90s, Jarman died, Greenaway kind of left, and you had these very complacent Brit films, which I couldn't stand, I hated them. Um, and now you're having quite individual voices, Joanna Hogg, I mean, okay, okay, she's more like me, she's kind of mid-career. Um, in terms of how many films she's made, but so yeah, I, I I think if you're new, there's still a lot of possibility out there in terms of public funding. The trick is when you get to private funding, people want their money back. Yeah. Then it's much harder to do yeah. individual things. That's that's when it gets tricky. That's a, um, a thing in Germany that you have uh, very high chances to get a film made when you come from a film school background and. Uh, it, um, there is a film called um, Systemsprenger by Nora Finkscheid. I don't know the, uh, does someone know the English title of Systemsprenger? System Crasher. Okay, System Crasher, okay. She, she got really famous for this film in worldwide response. And then this year? Yeah, uh, no, uh, two years ago. Uh, and um, it's about um, uh, a very aggressive, um, very young girl who has to be cared for, and it's a, it's a drama, it's social drama. And uh, then she got offered uh, a new film with Sandra Bullock, uh, funded by uh, Netflix. And uh, this was um, ambivalent, uh, because uh, this film could not be launched really successfully, and uh, so it's, um, yeah, she's still a point of interest in Germany because she's a very, a very good filmmaker, but um, it's really hard to, to get beyond the first film, uh, even in, in Germany. So uh, you have high chances to get recognition for a first film, uh, for a first short film, for a first, first feature film, but then it gets really um, uh, strange for uh, many people. So um I mean, maybe this is not, a good example, but you had Florian Henkel von Donnersmark with The Lives of the Others. Mm -hmm. Then a similar thing. He got seduced by Hollywood. He did The Tourist. Mm -hmm. But I think he's back now after a long absence. Yeah, he um, did this uh, artist uh, biography then, um, Werk ohne Autor. But uh, he is seen very ambivalent in Germany. It's not okay, I don't know that. Okay, because we just know the it's We don't know about him. Because okay. um, uh, German films are. Uh, really recepted differently abroad. Uh, I worked in uh, the USA in a uh, university and uh, everybody was talking about these great films, Run, Lola, Run, and uh, The Downfall. And I said, okay, The Downfall is really heavily criticized in Germany, uh, Der Untergang. Um, and uh, nobody could understand this because everybody thought this is the, the great German film of its time. And so we have totally different films which we are really fond of uh, and nobody he hears of them in um, uh, elsewhere. Uh, and it's a it's huge difference in um, reception there. Yeah, I mean, Britain, uh, it's a bit embarrassing to say, but we only had the three giants from the 70s, I and mean we haven't really heard about much since. Okay, you have Christian Petzgold now, uh, a few other directors, but you know, it's always the shadow of Herzog, Fassbinder, and Wenders, great filmmakers, of course. Um, but the others are always in the shadows, even Schlundorf, um I mean, I, there's a German film I really love called Taxi Zunklo, uh, Frank Riplo, which is, yeah, yeah it's, it's quite Zunklo, an yeah. un underground film. Um, it's not even available at the moment, as I think. Packadillo released it, it on is DVD. It's, okay, on, uh, on DVD. Salzgerber, it's sounds okay. great label, okay. Um, but uh, Werner Schlöter, very difficult to get those films. Um, yeah, Frank Rosa von Praunheim, I have to order, yeah. well, Clemens, you had to order on my behalf, but they come in little paper sleeves. But great but filmmaker. It's, it's again, um, the successful films of uh, the late 60s and early 70s were films like the um, um, Karl May uh, Western, the uh, Edgar Wallace films, and then the Schulmädchen Report, like the uh, soft sex films from Germany. I don't know those. And okay. Yeah, and these were really, really successful when Agüre came out and uh, was not recepted at that time. Uh, so um, 
what you're talking about is a retrospective, idealized idea of German um, film of the 70s. And I totally agree with you. That's no question. Yeah. You, uh, but it's, um, I think it's a kind of distorted idea of uh, what people really cared about <laughs> in the 70s. <laughs> you can correct me, but I think it's, it's quite appropriate. Because if you research which films were really uh, successful, it's always different films than uh, people from abroad think. Uh, they are important. Nobody wanted to see Karel by Fassbinder, his last film, which is a great film, but it's um, nobody wanted to see that film. Uh, Christian from Salzgerber just told me that there's uh, on YouTube a whole documentary about the making of Karel. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, Bauer von Babylon. Which I'm yeah. going to watch. Maybe Definitely. not. Maybe not on the train. Maybe it's not the best place to watch it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'll watch it at some point. Yeah. Time is up for us, and it was uh, it was a great pleasure to talk to you, and Likewise, especially, thank you. thank you, in this surrounding, which reminded me immediately of uh, Twin Peaks, and uh, so it's a really good uh, lightning and setting here, and uh, I felt really comfortable here. <laughs> actually, come again, you know, come come, <laughs> I'll put the kettle on. Come around for tea. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and thank you to the audience as well. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.